Hello, First Baptist family. Get a Bible. Let's go to Psalm 20. This is a psalm before battle, and I've got just two verses for this evening. Thank you for uh, tuning in tonight on this uh, snowy winter storm weather that we're having. So when bad things are closing in on you, what do you do? What do you do when you're anticipating circumstances that are really, really not good? Like in the new f- near future, when perhaps fear and worry arises or when they arise in your thoughts. When anxiety increases and as you think about what is just ahead in your life. I mean, it, it's visceral. You can feel it in your stomach sometimes. Have you ever felt that before? What do you do? Well, according to Psalm 20, you sing. Yes, sing. And I'm not talking about turning on the Beatles or Elvis or Hank Williams, Junior or otherwise, Def Leppard or Journey. I'm not talking about turning on the the Be Happy song. Do you remember that? Ain't got no cash, ain't got no style, ain't got no gal to make you smile. Don't worry, be happy. I'm not saying emotionally escape in music. I'm talking about singing a song to the Lord. Before the fight, sing. Before the battle, sing. When you're anticipating the fight, sing. When you're expecting potential loss, even the loss of life, sing. Now, you might be asking, okay, but what do I sing? You won't let me sing the Be Happy song or turn on some good 80s tunes that I like. You say don't escape emotionally in music. What do I sing? This is what you sing. You sing the two verses that I have from Psalm 20. And you might be thinking, well, this is is not practical, Mark. This is not practical. Yeah, well, listen to, wait wait until you listen to the historical context of this, this psalm, Psalm 20. So let's begin by looking at the context of the psalm, and then uh, we'll dive in together. We'll read it, and then we'll look at these two verses, okay? Um. Before we get to the ancient and modern context, I invite you to look at the graphic, which is on the back of your handout. It shows how the 150 psalms uh, can be grouped by kind. And I've got an arrow there pointing to little Psalm 20 there. It's a royal psalm. You'll notice there's the praise psalms, the, the psalms of lament or trust and thanksgiving, etc. So you notice Psalm 20 here is part of the uh, genre or type of psalm that's called royal psalm, having to do with the king. Uh, By the way, did you notice on this which kind of psalm has the most uh, in the book? Is it praise? Most people think that there's more praises in the book of psalms. But no, look, it's the, the lament. The lament song make up the most. Now, as it relates to the ancient context, one commentator I'm quoting here, he says, this day of trouble, which is found in verse 1, is one of impending battle, as the chariots of verse 7 make clear. The shape of the psalm brings the scene before us as the king prepares to march to war. His prayers and sacrifices are offered, his plans prepared, and his men grouped with their standards. It is one of the most stirring of the Psalms by its tense awareness of life and death issues soon to be solved. So yeah, this is real practical. Its companion piece is the next Psalm, all exuberance and delight. That's it. That's Derek Kidner. Now, as it relates to our modern context, right? Temper Longman, and I'm quoting him here, he says, the battlefield was the original setting for this Psalm, which confidently asks God for victory in the face of an enemy. Today, the people of God are a spiritual entity, the church, not a nation state with armies and physical enemies that attack it with swords, spears, or other physical weapons. Even so, he continues, the church and individual Christians are in a battle, not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's Ephesians 6, 12. Against these enemies, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians 10, but rather we need divine power to demolish strongholds. 
And it is in this context of spiritual warfare that Psalm 20 retains its relevance in the life of God's people today. Again, that's Trimper Longman. All right, having said that, let's dive into the psalm itself. Notice, hear the word of the Lord, beginning in verse 1. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. May he send you help from the sanctuary and support you from Zion. May he remember all your meal offerings and find your burnt offerings acceptable. Selah. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your counsel. We will sing for joy over your victory. And in your name, rather, and in the name of our God, we will set up banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now, I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stood upright. Save, O Lord. May the king answer us in the day we call. All right, so let's get to the two verses. Number one, very simply, sing a song that has appeals to God. Sing a song that has appeals to God. We see this in verses 1 through 5, as well as the last verse of the psalm, verse 9. And there's several appeals here in these verses. For example, sing a song that God would answer your appeals by his name, by his name. Again, verse 1, may the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. The name represents God. I wish I had time to show you this, but when you study the name in the Old Testament, it's a second Yahweh figure. Of course, as Christians, we know him as Jesus, right? Here's another appeal, that God would send help and support. Do you need that? Need that today? We need that for future battles as well, right? That God would send help and support. And it could be spiritual. It could be emotional. It could be physical, financial. God, send help and support. Here's another appeal. That God would remember your worship. In verse 3, it says, May he remember all your meal offerings and find your burnt offerings acceptable. Right? So, Sing a song that God would remember your worship. And remember, in the Bible, for for God to remember something, it's not like he's old and he forgot. But for God to remember, it's in the sense of uh, it's an appeal to God that he would move on your behalf. Here's another appeal, that God would give your heart's desire. The psalmist says as much in verse 4. And then here's the last appeal here that we're picking out from the psalm, that God would grant you victory. That God would grant you victory. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, this is going to be a short um, Bible study. We're already on, on number two. Well, maybe, maybe not. Number two, sing a song that not only has appeals to God, sing a song that has assurance in God. Now look at look at verse uh, 6 again, if you have your Bible. Now I know that the Lord saves. You notice that? Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Um, now, if it is correct that this is a song sung before battle, before holy war, then why the past tense language in verse 8? If you still have your Bibles open, let's go to verse 8. I don't have that yet. I don't have that on the slide, so I'll just read it if you don't have your Bible open. It says, they have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stood upright. So do you see the sense of assurance here in verse uh, 8? It's it's like past tense language, but yet the psalm is about a future impending battle. This has led one commentator to say, quote, he has no doubt as to the outcome of the battle. And for the first time we hear for whom the psalmist is praying that you of the verse first five verses is now identified as the anointed. That is the king. Uh, The commentator continues, he says, the king's victory is assured by God. 
in verse 2, the prior, the prayer requests divine help from the sanctuary in Zion. Here in verse 6, that this help comes from his heavenly sanctuary. And of course, these are not two different places. The earthly sanctuary situated on Mount Zion in Jerusalem is an is a, uh, earthly symbol of God's heavenly abode. We've talked about that before as it relates to the big Bible story. Trimper Longman continues, he says, Mount Zion connects heaven and earth. The answer comes in the form of a power that leads to victory, a power that is represented by God's right hand, which is also associated with uh, God's warring activity. For example, in, ex- uh, in Exodus fifteen six, this was part of the song that was sung after the Lord delivered his people from Egyptian bondage when he split the Red Sea for them and then closed the Red Sea upon their enemies. This is song, uh, rather, this is Exodus fifteen six. Your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. So when we have this sense of anxiety or fear about an impending battle or we're up against some significant spiritual warfare, yeah, sing a song. Sing a song that asks God for the saving strength of his right hand. In that same song of Moses, in Exodus 15 and verse 12, it says, You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. So let's sing a song that has assurance in God. For example, Isaiah 41.10. Isaiah 41.10, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So, beloved, let's sing a song that asks God for the saving strength of his right hand. Amen. God is speaking to us through his word tonight. Amen. Are you listening? Sing. Sing before the battle. Sing as the battle rages and sing after the battle. In fact, sing until you finally get home. Not on the street here on in the colony or whatever town you live in. No, your final home in the presence of your great God. Now, I realize that this particular song has been stamped as a royal psalm. Um, there's different ways scholars group the psalms by structure. Um I've showed you this one. It's a royal psalm. Here are the psalms divided by structure. Chiasm, acrostic, or strophe. Strophe is like a verse or verses that make up a unit in poetry. An acrostic is like A. uh, Let's see. A, always I will give thanks to the Lord. B. um, Let's see what would be a good one for B. Um. Before I go to sleep, I will praise the Lord. C, Christ is Lord. D, deliver me, God. You know, that kind of thing. And then a chiasm. We've talked about what a chiasm is. But so what my point is here is the more I looked at this psalm, the more I saw this as a chiasm in its structure. Now, if you notice in here, the, the grouping of chiasm, there is no Psalm 20. There is no Psalm 20. It's in the, the larger section to the right, the strophe, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But I wanted to show you uh, visually why I think uh, this is a, uh, there's some chiasm going on in this psalm. Uh, remember a chiasm, they didn't have a way to italicize or draw a line or bold. Uh, chiasm is a way to bring emphasis from a literary perspective. And you'll see here, There's a huge chiasm in Genesis 6. I've showed you this before all the way to uh, chapter 9. And the chiasm is God remembers Noah. So that's one of the key huge theological truths about the flood story. God remembers Noah, right? And you'll see how each correspond to one another. The A, the B, the C, the D goes to the X, and then it goes back the other way. I've also showed you this relating to uh, the book of the Revelation as a whole. From a literary perspective, what's the point of the book of the Revelation? Right there in the heart of it, Revelation 12, 12. Satan is cast out. He's cast out. So back to our psalm. Notice in verse 1, if you still still have your Bibles open, or just look at the screen here, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. That's verse 1. Look at the last verse. Save, O Lord, may the king, what? 
answer us in the day we call. Answer verse 1, answer verse 9. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. That's the second part of verse 1. And look at verses 7 and 8. Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in what? The name of the Lord our God. So verse 1b, you have the name of the God of Jacob. Verse 7, we'll boast in the name of the Lord our God. The second half of 1b, may the God of Jacob set you securely on high. Look at verse 8. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have stood and risen upright. So you see how they correspond to one another? Next, verse 2, may he send you help from the sanctuary. Look at verse 6. Where does the help come from? Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his what? Holy heaven, the heavenly sanctuary. So you see a correspondence in verse 2, correspondence in verse 6, and of course, from a literary perspective, I'm saying this, this might be the very heart of it. May he grant you your desires, your heart's desire, and fulfill all your counsel. We will sing for joy over your victory, and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. So, <clears throat> I don't know, I just thought it was interesting. I didn't see this in any commentary or anything, but it seems if this is correct from a literary perspective, then the very heart of the psalm are verses 4 and 5. And they seem to be a summary of the entire psalm to me. Okay? Well, let's go back to verse 7. Let's go back to verse 7 here. Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. If you'll notice that there. The name of the Lord, again, stands for himself. And one scholar notes that the name is used in three ways in this psalm. This is insightful. I didn't, I didn't see this. In verse 7, this is the third time it is used. And this one scholar, a Bullinger, Bullinger he pointed out in verse 1, the name defends. Verse 5, the name is displayed. And in verse 7, the name delivers. So you have the name defends in verse 1, the name is displayed in verse 5, the name delivers. I thought that was great. I love that. Amen. God will defend you, beloved. God is displayed when he defends you, and it is in his name that we are delivered. Not by man's means, not by the ways of this fallen world. In the context of this psalm, not ultimately by the weapons of this world, such as chariots and in horses. It's like uh, David uh, before he was king, you might recall he was he was a shepherd, right? It was what he learned as a shepherd that gave him confidence before that wicked Nephilim giant named Goliath. And do you remember what he said to that wicked thing before he cut his head off? Actually, let's begin with what the giant said first. Let's get a little context here. This is Goliath, that Nephilim. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, Why do you come out to draw up in battle array? Am I not the Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. Again, the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. What do you think the response is among God's people? Verse 11, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. This is what the enemy likes to produce in the heart of God's people. Fear. Fear. COVID. Cold. Cancer, sickness, Omicron, death, fear, fear of loneliness, fear of this, that. You may recall what David told King Saul when he found out. He said, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like, will be like one of them since he has taunted the armies of the living God. Wow. What a resume. Who kills lions and bears? 
He was a shepherd boy. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. Finally, we got someone who's going to be fighting. Now, this is what the giant said to David when he came to fight him. This is very practical. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy with a handsome appearance. Who is this guy? Who is this guy? The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. You notice that? The Philistine also said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you, look at this, in the name of the Lord of hosts. You see that name again? The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. By the way, no, I just noticed this. Notice in the middle of verse 46, I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day. David knew, this is interesting, David was not only confident that I'm going to kill you, but we're going to kill all of you. You see that? Never seen that before. Next verse. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear or by the, right, the the ways of man. No, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Wow. Wow. So as we close, beloved, what is the proper response to evil when there's an impending battle, when it seems like in the near future it does not look good, it looks like the enemy is going to win, there's going to be a fight, there's going to be a battle when you're anticipating a, a battle or you're in one right now. According to Psalm 20, sing a song. Sing a song with appeals to the Lord and do so with assurance in your great God. Use the appeals in this psalm, in your song, and in your prayer time. Now, as a closing illustration, I want to bring in Second Chronicles 20. This is within regard to King Jehoshaphat and the people of God. They were in big trouble, big trouble. Look at verse 1. Now, it came about after this that the sons of Moab... And the sons of Ammon, together with some of the Minuites, came to make war against Jehoshaphat. I wish I could read this whole chapter, but basically the king stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord. And you know what he did? He prayed. And this was part of his prayer. Look at this. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Amen. Amen. All Judah was standing before the Lord with their infants, their wives, and their children. Now, this is the king. Actually, uh, this this is not the king here. There was a prophet that uh, stood up and he prophesied in the midst of the assembly. Uh, The scripture says that the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, uh, who was a Levite. And listen to what he said here. Listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King uh, King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not fear. Or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz, 
and you will find them at the end of the valley in front of the wilderness of Jeruel. You need not fight in this battle. Station yourselves, stand, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. By the way, that, that verb stand, that's in Ephesians 6, right? We're to stand. We don't have to fight. We simply stand in the Lord. The Lord does the fighting. The prophet continues, Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. Isn't that beautiful? For the Lord is with you. Look what the king did. Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and in the, the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Amen. Before the battle, Worship. As you battle, worship. After the battle, worship. In fact, verse 19, look at this. Do I have it? Uh, there it is. The Levites from the sons of the Kohathites and of the sons of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a very loud voice. All right. So now that you know the context, right, of, of 2 Chronicles 20, I showed you these verses to highlight this, this right here. Look at this, verse 21. When he had consulted with the people, this is talking about this is back to King Jehoshaphat. Uh, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire as they went out before the army. He puts the choir in front of the army and said, Give thanks to the Lord for his chesed, his loving, loyal covenant love, his mercy, his loving kindness is everlasting. When they began singing, if you're writing your Bibles, Get Second Chronicles twenty twenty two, highlight it, underline it, box it. When they began singing and praising, the Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so they were routed. That's victory, beloved. Victory by faith. Victory by praying. Victory by worshiping. Victory by singing. And notice what these ambushes created within the enemies of God. Look at verse 23. For the sons of Ammon and Moab rose up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, destroying them completely. And when they had finished with the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. What? The enemies destroyed one another. That's what God does. That's called an ambush from the Lord. He brought chaos into the camp of chaos. He brought disorder into the, those that bring disorder. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Look at the next verse here. When Judah came to the lookout of the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and behold, there were corpses lying on the ground, and no one had escaped. Now, not only this, when your enemies are dead, on this occasion, guess what that means? That means you can take from them. Look at the next verse. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil, they found much among them, including goods, garments, valuable things, which they took for themselves more than they could carry. And they were and they were uh, three days taking the spoil because there was so much. Three days to pick up the spoil. Beloved, this is a great victory. And this is what we have in Jesus Christ, right? This is what we have in Jesus Christ. So this is a song before battle. Sing a song that has appeals to God. That has appeals to God. That God would answer your appeals by his name, by Jesus. That God would help send support and help. That God would remember your worship, not just a cognitive recollection, but he would, he would move on your behalf because of your worship. That God would give you your heart's desire. That God would grant you victory. Sing a song that has appeals to God, beloved, and sing a song that has assurance in God. He will fight for you. You stand. You stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. Let's pray together. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you so much for our time together. 
pray that you would continue to protect your, fo- your flock from danger seen and unseen, physical and spiritual. Continue to provide for your flock in the name of Jesus Christ. Help us to stand, Lord. Despite the circumstances, despite our feelings, help us to stand according to your word and to petition your throne of grace, not just to ask for it, but to obtain help and find mercy in our time of need. And that need is tonight, Lord. So bless your people with strength. Bless them with assurance and confidence in you and what you have done for us in Jesus Christ. You've promised never to leave us or forsake us. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.